welcome back to the discussion of recognition of an antigen by the adaptive immune system. In this series, we are discussing how the cells of the adaptive immune system work tirelessly to fight a wide range of pathogens that you encounter in everyday life. And it's thanks to these warriors we are able to fend off all sorts of threats from bacteria to viruses and all sorts of creepy crawlies that nature throws our way. In the previous sections, we had a detailed discussion about immunoglobulins or otherwise known as antibodies. We saw their structure and how do they recognize and interact with antigens in the extracellular space. But now let's draw our attention to the category of molecules that are responsible for handling a rampaging attack of infectious agents that are the T cells. Now let's make a mind map of how the various steps or aspects fall into place. Initially, whenever a pathogen enters the body, it is taken up by the antigen presenting cells. It is displayed via the MHC class 2 molecules. Specialized cells that are known as the CD4 T cells recognize the bound peptide and are activated to affect T cells. These cells release cytokines that work to activate other cells of the body, namely the cytotoxic T cells, the B cells that continue to make the antibodies, and macrophages that work to engulf the antigens. The cytotoxic T cells or the CD8 T cells recognize the antigens that are presented by the MHC class 1 molecules and they get activated to cytotoxic T lymphocytes which work relentlessly to kill and wend off the infection. So how do the T cells actually work? So long story short, the T cells recognize the antigen as a small fragment bound to an MHC molecule that are displayed upon the cell surface. So in this section, we will discuss how do the T cells recognize this antigen. How this antigen it is processed for the presentation by the MHC molecule, it is a topic for further discussion. So right now, we need to ponder on the exact structure that recognizes the antigen that is the T cell receptor. We will look at the exact structure of the T cell receptor, the genes that encode them, and focus on the key similarities and differences between the T cell receptor and the immunoglobulin molecule. Firstly, focusing on the similarities. The T cell receptor resembles a membrane-bound fab fragment. Remember from the last section, where we cleaved the antibody into the functionally distinct forms. There we saw that the fab fragment of an antibody molecule, it is a disulfide-linked heterodimer, which can, each chain of which contains one immunoglobulin C domain and one V domain. The juxtaposition of the V domains forms the antigen binding site. The T cell receptor also is a disulfide-linked heterodimer, in which each chain consists an immunoglobulin C-like domain and an immunoglobulin V-like domain. As in the fab fragment, the juxtaposition of the V domains forms the site of antigen recognition. Looking at the structure in a bit of a more detail, we can see that the T cell receptor heterodimer it is composed of two transmembrane glycoprotein chains, namely alpha and beta. The extracellular portion of each chain consists of two domains, resembling immunoglobulin V and C domains respectively. Both chains have hydrocarbon side chains attached to each domain. A short stalk segment analogous to an immunoglobulin hinge region connects the ig like domains to the membrane and contains the cysteine residues that forms the interchain disulfide bond. The transmembrane helixes of both of the chains are unusual in containing positive charge or basic residues within the hydrophobic transmembrane segment. The alpha chain carries two such residues and the beta chain just consists of one. In order to understand the differences, we shall look at the crystal structure of the homodiamer. Here the alpha chain it is shown in pink and the beta chain in blue, while the disulfide bonds are shown in green. The panel A, you can see the T cell receptor it is viewed from the side as it would sit on the cell surface receptor like the one that is displayed on the right hand side of the screen. Further, the CDR loops that form the antigen binding site are labeled 1, 2 and 3 and are arrayed across its relatively flat top. In the second panel, you can see the C alpha and the C beta domains. So indicating the differences, one of the main differences between the T cell receptor and the immunoglobulin molecule lies in how they are built. The C alpha domain in the TCR does not fold into a typical Ig-like domain. The face of the domain away from the C beta domain, it is mainly composed of irregular strands of polypeptide rather than beta sheets. The intermolecular disulfide bond joins the beta strand to this segment of alpha helix. The interaction between the C alpha and the C beta domains is assisted by the carbohydrate depicted here in gray with a sugar group from the C alpha domain making hydrogen bond to the C beta domain. 
In the C alpha domain, the intramolecular disulfide bond, which in IG like domain normally binds two beta strands, join an alpha strand to this segment of an alpha helix. The second major difference lies in the means of interaction. There is a major difference in the way in which the domains interact. The interface between the V and the C domain of both the T cell receptor chains is more extensive than in most antibodies. The interaction between the C alpha and the C beta domains is distinctive as it might be assisted by carbohydrates with a sugar group from the C alpha domain making several hydrogen bonds to the C beta domain. Finally, a comparison of the variable binding site showed that although the CDR loops align closely with those of antibody molecule, there is some relative displacement as it can be seen in the third part of the figure. This is particularly marked in the V alpha CDR2 loop, which is oriented at roughly right angle to the equivalent loop in antibody V domains. As a result of a shift in the beta strand that anchors one end of the loop from one phase of the domain to the other. The strand displacement also causes a change in the orientation of the V-beta CDR2 loop in some V-beta domain. These differences with antibodies influence the ability of the T-cell receptor to recognize the specific ligands as we will see in the later sec sections. Now, I talked about a lot of other components, one of which was the MHC molecule. So now let's uh, divert our attention to the next part of the T-cell that is required for the antigen recognition, that is basically the MHC molecule. The T-cell basically, as we saw earlier, recognizes an antigen in the form of a complex of a foreign peptide bound to an MHC molecule. So what is exactly an MHC molecule? The simple answer it is that when the foreign peptides are needed to be presented to the cell surface, specialized glycoproteins are used from within the cell to carry the intercellular antigen to the cell surface. These glycoproteins are called MHC molecules and are very important for antigen presentation. These are encoded in a large cluster of genes that were first identified by their powerful effects on the immune response to transplanted organs. For this region, the gene complex was known as major histocompatibility complex and the peptide binding glycoproteins are known as the MHC molecule. There are two classes of MHC class molecules, MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 and they differ in both their structure and their expression patterns in the tissues of the body. The MHC class 1, it is expressed on all nucleated cells of the body and the MHC class 2, it is expressed by specialized cells that are known as antigen presenting cells, namely the dendritic cells, B lymphocytes and the macrophages. But what about the red blood cells? They're not exactly nucleated. So non-nucleated cells such as the mammalian red blood cells express little or no MHC class 1 and thus are interior of red blood cells it is a site where an infection can go undetected by the cytotoxic T cells. Because red blood cells cannot support viral replication this is of no great consequence for viral infection but it might be the absence of the MHC class 1 that allows parasites like plasmodium to cause that cause malaria to live within such privileged sites. So now let's look a little bit of more detail into these MHC class molecules. The MHC class 1 molecule consists of two polypeptide chains as it is shown within the figure. One chain, the alpha chain, it is encoded in the MHC that is on the chromosome number 6 and it is non-covalently associated with a smaller chain, beta 2 microglobulin, which is encoded on a different chromosome, the chromosome 15 in the case of humans. Only the class 1 alpha chain spans the membrane. The complete MHC class 1 molecule has four domains three formed from the MHC encoded alpha and one contributed by the beta 2 microglobulin. The alpha 3 domain and the beta 2 microglobulin closely resemble the IG domains in their folded structure. The folded alpha 1 and alpha 2 domain forms the walls of the cleft on the surface of the molecule because this is where the peptide binds. This part of the MHC molecule it is known as a peptide binding cleft or peptide binding group. Analogous to the MHC class 1 molecule, the MHC class 2 molecule consists of a non-covalent complex of two chains, the alpha and beta, both of which span the membrane. The MHC class 2 alpha chain it is different protein from the MHC class 1 alpha chain. The MHC class 2 alpha beta chains are both encoded within the MHC. The crystallographic structure of the MHC class 2 molecule shows that it is folded very much like the MHC class 1 molecule but the peptide binding cleft is formed by two domains of different chains, the alpha 1 and alpha 2 domain. The major differences lie at the ends of the peptide binding cleft, which are more open in the case of MHC class 2 than in the MHC class 1 molecule. 
Consequently, the ends of a peptide bound to an MHC class 1 molecule are substantially buried within the molecules, whereas the ends of a peptide bound to the MHC class 2 molecules, they are exactly not. In both MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules, bound peptides are sandwiched between two alpha helical segments of the MHC molecule. The T-cell receptor interacts with this compound lichen, making contacts with both the MHC molecule and the peptide antigen. As in the case of MHC class 1 molecule, the sites of major polymorphisms in the MHC class 2 molecules are located in the peptide binding cleft. And we are going to have a little bit of more discussion about this exact concept in the next slides. But the next thing is that sets apart the peptide binding by the MHC molecules from other peptide binding receptors. It is at the peptide bound to an MHC molecule serves as an integral component of the MHC molecule's structure and they are unstable when the peptide it is not bound to them. This dependence is actually very much important otherwise the peptide exchanges that occur all the time on the cell surface would render the MHC presentation useless as an indicator of cellular infection. Uh, to get a better look at the nature of the bound peptide and the site that accommodates them, the MHC class 1 molecules can actually be purified and in this procedure what happens it is that the peptides bound to them also cure purify with them and this fact basically has helped scientists to analyze the peptides. Uh, they are uh, can be purified and then they are made to release from the MHC molecules by denaturing the complex in an acid and after that they can be purified and subjected to sequence analysis. Uh, and using the same principle, the MHC molecules uh, that they can bind the peptides can be used by allowing pure synthetic peptides to be incorporated into uh, the empty MHC molecules. From there, the structure of the complex can be determined, uh, which can help to reveal the details of the contact between the MHC molecules and the peptides. And such experiments can allow us to develop a detailed picture of the binding interaction between the peptides and the MHC molecules. So in the next step, we will investigate the details of these binding interactions of the MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules individually, starting off with an MHC molecule. So binding of a peptide to an MHC class 1 molecule, it is stabilized at both ends of the peptide binding cleft uh, by contacts between the atoms in the free amino acids and the carboxy terminals of the peptide and invariant sites that are found uh, at each end of the cleft in all of the MHC class 1 molecules as it is shown in the figure and these are actually considered to be the main stabilizing contacts of the peptide uh, and MHC complexes. Synthetic peptides that were basically constructed to either lack the amino or the carboxy terminal, they fail to bind to such an MHC complex. Talking about the size of uh, the peptide that can be accommodated, so it is basically 8 to 10 amino acids but uh, if there are uh, peptides that are longer than this, they can actually be accommodated. Um, if they bind by the carboxy terminus, they are basically cleaved to 8 to 10 amino acid uh, through exopeptidases uh, that are basically produced within the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and because the peptide it lies in an elongated conformation along the cleft, and hence the variation within the peptide length can also be accommodated by kinking uh, the peptide in the backbone. So longer uh, fragments that can actually be bent to be accommodated in this section. Uh, the length variation can also be accommodated in the MHC class 1 molecule by allowing the peptide to be extended out of the cl cleft at the carboxy terminus. So only at the carboxy terminus, not at the both terminus, longer peptides can also be accommodated. In the case of MHC molecules, these are basically very, very highly polymorphic, uh, which means that there exists a great amount of allelic variation in the genes that encode them. So basically meaning that every person uh, in them carries a selected assortment of allelic vari variants and these even are restricted to the amino acids that span the peptide interaction sites. So different MHC variants preferentially bind different peptides and the peptides that can bind to a given MHC variant have the same or very similar amino acid residues at two or three particular positions along the peptide sequence. The amino acid side chains at these positions insert into pockets within the MHC molecules that are lined by the polymorphic amino acids and because this binding anchors the peptide to the MHC molecule, these peptides are known as anchor residues as they are depicted within the figure. The position and identity of these anchor residues it varies depending upon the particular MHC class 1 variant that is being considered. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, most of the peptides that bind to the MHC class 1 molecules have a hydrophobic or sometimes basic residue at the carboxy terminus that allows several anchor the peptide in the group. Uh, if one were to change the anchor residues, it will basically prevent uh, the interaction between the MHC molecule and the peptide. But not all of the synthetic uh, of these residues are required for this interaction and some of them they may basically favor 
the interaction and some of them may loosen the interaction. So, these other determining uh, moieties they are basically known as the secondary anchors. Well, looking at the MLC class 2 molecules, the uh, clusters of conserved residues that bind the two ends of the peptide in the MLC class 1 molecules, they are not exactly found within the MLC class 2 molecules and the ends of the peptide they are not bound. Inside the peptide, it basically lies in an extended conformation along the peptide binding cleft and it is held there both by peptide side chains that protrude into shallow and deep pockets lined by polymorphic residues and by interaction between the peptide backbone and the side chains of conserved amino acids that line the peptide binding cleft in all of the MSC class 2 molecules. The peptides are basically 13 amino acids in length and the binding pockets of the MSC molecules they accommodate a great variety of side chains than those of the MSC class 1 molecules. Uh, basically making it a little bit more difficult to define the anchor residues and to predict which peptides will be able to interact with this. But uh, by comparing the sequence of known binding peptides, it may be possible to detect the patterns of amino acids that permit the binding of different MHC class 2 variants and to model how the amino acids from this peptide sequence motif will interact with the amino acids of the peptide binding cleft. That being said, we can consider that because the peptide is bound by its backbone and allowed to emerge from both ends of the binding group, there is in principle no upper limit to the length of the peptides that can bind to the MHC class 2 molecule. So now moving back to the T-cell receptor and looking at how the MHC molecules are involved within the T-cell receptors. So uh, the extra crystallographic structure of the T-cell receptor shows that it is aligned diagonally over the peptide and the peptide binding cleft. So this is basically how you will find the interaction between the MHC molecule and the T-cell receptor. Uh, and this basically illustrates different orientations and both of them they basically indicate that the, uh, the T-cell receptor basically is aligned diagonally over the peptide and the peptide binding cleft. And now let's let see a little bit of how the MHC molecules interact with the CD8 and the CD4 T-cells. So from this slide you basically remember the link between the T-cell receptors and the CD4 and the CD8 T-cells. Uh, so now look, uh, now what we have to do, it is we have to look at the structure of the T-cells, both of them, the CD4 and the CD8 T-cells, in a little bit of a more detail to uh, develop our understanding about this very basic framework. So from this, uh, we can see as a comparative view of the CD4 and the CD8 T-cells. So the CD4 is basically a single chain protein composed of four Ig-like domains, as you can see within the diagram. The first two domains uh, are named D1 and D2 and they are packed tightly together to form a rigid uh, rod of about 6 uh, nanometer uh, and this is basically joined by a very flexible hinge to a similar rod formed by the third and fourth domain that is the D3 and the D4. Uh, the binding site or the MHC binding region as it is it called uh, on the CD4 it is located on the lateral face of the D1 domain and the CD4 binds to the hydrophobic crevice formed at the junction of the alpha 2 and the beta 2 domains of the MHC class 2 molecule. So two takeaways, it is a structural difference and the second is that the CD4 uh, receptor, it interacts with the MHC class 2 molecules. In contrast, we see a strikingly different structure of the CD8 receptor. It is a disulfide linked dimer of two different chains that are known as an alpha and a beta chain uh, which each consists of an IG-like domain linked to the membrane by a segment of extended uh, polypeptides. And this segment is basically highly, highly glycosylated and it has been shown to greatly influence the strength of interaction between the CD8 and the MHC class 1 molecule. So over here, the key takeaways from the differences is the structural variability and the second it is how do these basically interact with different classes of MHC molecules. So this basically concludes our discussion about how the adaptive immune system responds to the antigens that are presented to them. And if you get this name, you basically get all of the concepts that are covered in this chapter. So if you want to learn more about immunology, stay tuned and we'll be right back.